Good morning, everyone. It's 10 a.m. Eastern Time. We're going to get started with our webinar here today. I'd like to say hello and thank you for joining us for our fourth international webinar series of 2012. The session is regarding in vivo-like culture conditions for cell-based assays and tissue reconstruction. My name is Mackenzie Ferrone, and I will serve as your host for this webinar session. Over the, of the next 40 minutes, Dr. Sven Molfriedel will present information on the principles of migration and invasion assays, culture, and tissue reconstruction. If you have difficulties with your audio during the webinar, we like to remind you to please make sure you're listening directly through your computer speakers and that the volume is turned up to a reasonable level. Continue to have difficulties, please your chat feature to message the host, and we will do our best to get the issue resolved. Please feel free to use the WebEx chat as a vehicle to ask questions. You can share a question at any time, and we will make a sincere effort to respond to all before the end of the web webinar. My pleasure to introduce Dr. Sven Mulfriedel, who leads the Cell Culture Group of the Research and Development Department at Greiner Bio 1. Dr. Mulfriedel studied biology at both the University of Henna in Germany and the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. In his doctoral studies at the Maplink Institute, he did his expertise in the fields of cell biology, molecular biology, and neuroscience. Today, Dr. Mulfriedel is responsible for the continual improvement and development of products for mammalian cell culture, reconstruction, separation, and storage. I will turn it over to Sven. Mackenzie, I thank you for the very kind introduction, and I would also like to welcome everybody from my side. As already told by Mackenzie, I will today address the achievement of in vivo-like cell culture conditions by using cell culture inserts. After a brief introduction, I would like to address different fields of application, starting with migration and invasion assays. I would like to talk about epithelia and transport studies. I will address co-culture, tissue reconstruction, and organotypic culture, and finally would end with drawing your attention to some further readings, which you can use to deep insight into this matter. So uh, I would like to start with a comparison of classical animal experimentation to be seen on the left-hand side to the cell culture to, uh, to be seen to the right. If you perform an animal experiment, your cells are growing in a 3D matrix at rather high cell densities, which leads to a rather complex assay. But you have to be aware that your assay can be limited in terms of its applicability because you may be confronted with ethical concerns, because your animal experiment may simply be harmful or stressful to the animal and may not be applicable. If we now look to the right, we see the classical 2D cell culture world. And if you move your experiment from animal experimentation to 2D cell culture, you are actually not facing any um, restrictions in terms of ethical concerns anymore. They are now grown in a 2D matrix, in a 2D environment, at rather moderate cell densities. And by doing so, you also reduce the complexity of your assay. This can be good at a certain extent, because uh, reduced complexity can make it easier for you to draw your conclusion. It can also mean that this is actually an advantage because reduced complexity can reduce the meaningfulness and physiological relevance of your essay. We now introduce the cell culture insert, which is done with this chart here. You will see in a few minutes that you gain a lot by introducing these devices. Cell culture inserts consist of cylinder, which is made of polystyrene or a comparable polymer, and the cylinder is closed on its bottom by a porous membrane. The membrane con contains micropores of the sizes of 0.4, 1, 3, or 8 micrometers. And inserts have these little arms here, which allow the insert to um, hang in, an, in a carrier plate. And by inserting such an insert into the carrier plate, Keep in mind that there are pores in the bottom. You create a two-compartment system with two compartments which can communicate, and um, the arm makes sure that the insert is hanging at a distance that it's not touching the bottom of the well plate. And by introducing such a two-compartment system, you can mimic all kinds of in vivo situations in vitro. In this chart here, there's an overview given on these different in vivo situations. It starts with the situation of physical translocation of a cell from one place to another. We call this a migration phenomenon, and 
the study is a migration study. These studies are carried out with inserts. We carry three or eight micrometer pores. In e, C, and D, you see um, other applications with insert. These are transport studies, co-cultures, and organotypic cultures. And these studies are performed with 0.4 or 1 micrometer pores in the insert membrane. So if we go back to the migration assay, it works in the following way. You insert the insert into the plate. You add medium to the upper and lower compartments. You may want to add also a chemoattractive substance to the lower compartment. And then you see cells of interest on top of the membrane. And what happens after a certain time of incubation in a cell culture incubator is that your cells can yeah, kind of detect that there is a chemoattractant in the lower compartment and cells can start to migrate downwards. They make themselves slim, they change their cytoskeleton and end up after migration through the pores uh, on the lower side of the membrane in an adherent status. So you can simply detach these cells and quantify the amount of migratory cells. A transport study is a bit of a different world. Here you are working, as I said before, with smaller pores of 0.4 or 1 micrometer. And here you would basically be interested in epithelial cells. Seed these cells on top of your porous membrane, and these epithelial cells will grow to confluency and will form a tight pair. They will form tight junctions, and fuels cannot enter this barrier anymore solely due to diffusion. On the other hand side, the following can happen if a substance is transportable and you add it to the lower compartment, could be, for instance, radioactively marked, and you find that in the upper compartment, this substance must have been transported, and by yeah, following this simple experimental design, you can set up a meaningful transport assay. Code is a bit similar. It also works with small pores of 0.4 or 1 micrometer in your porous membrane. And here, a second cell population comes into the play. Um, is, it is shown here in green on the bottom of the well plate. And what you would like to study is basically the interaction of these different cell types uh, with each other. This can be paracrine signaling. This can also be a virus released from one cell population and infecting the other one. Yet a bit different is organotypic culture and airlift culture. Here you are working with small pores, but a striking difference is that the level of your medium is lowered to exactly the level of the porous membrane. What you can now do is you can seed cells on top of the membrane, or you can even uh, put an entire chunk or, of tissue or um, a slice of an organ on, on top of the, t uh, of the membrane, and um, these um, reconstructed tissues or organotypic cultures, they usually um, are grown at, at a very high cell density. And this requires a lot of oxygen or oxygen supply to your uh, culture. And this can be achieved by exactly what was suggested before, namely the reduction of the level of your cell culture medium to the level of the membrane. By doing so, it's made sure that liquid, water, nutrients, and vitamins all are supplied from below your culture um, by the cell culture medium, whereas um, O2 and CO2, they are supplied uh, from above um, at a certain extent that is required. And if we now... Um, compare our cell culture insert to classical 2D cell culture, which is done in this chart, you see that um, quite some achievements were made. Whereas cells uh, can only be grown in 2D at rather moderate cell densities, they can be grown at much higher cell densities now. This was achieved by growing the cells in different uh, layers. Um, the complexity of your system is now dramatically increased, um, but still you keep all the advantages that you um, had already gained by introducing 2D cell culture, which there are no ethical concerns and applicability of such a culture insert essay wherever and whenever you want. And now um, in the next 30 minutes, I would like to go a bit more in detail with these different applications. I would like to provide basic protocols which you can use 
um, to design our own experiments. And I would like to also um, provide a little bit of proof of principle for these different essays. I'd like to start with migration and invasion. And it requires a changes in the cell for a cell um, to make it migrate. And these are basically signal, signaling transduction processes which are taking place and all rearrangements of the cytoskeleton. But also externally, um, extracellularly, there are things going on. There are stimuli which attract the cell and all changes in the um, extracellular matrix finally make sure that the cell may detach from its neighbors and start to migrate. Such, uh, migration processes take place in the embryo. For instance, if we think of gastrulation, migration of neural crest cells, but also migration of cortical neurons or germ cell migration. But if we look at an adult organism, we see quite a lot of migration going on. For instance, if it comes to regeneration or wound healing, or even more important for scientists and medical doctors, if it comes to pathology, um, if we just think of inflammatory reaction, the formation of metastases in cancer, arthritis, chronic inflammation, and also arteriosclerosis. All these processes, migration takes place, and sometimes it worsens um, the um, effect the disease has to the uh, patient. Um, for instance, if we think of the invasion of immune cells into a cartilage which um, is damaged. It makes the process and the degeneration of cartilage even worse. But if we, on the other hand side, would be able to interfere with these invasion and migration processes, we would achieve quite something. And therefore, cell migration, also in the context of cancer, is a very important topic of research. In this uh, next slide here, I would like to suggest um, pretty base but um, reducible and powerful migration essay, which is also laid down in one of our application notes, which I will point your interest or attention to at the end of this presentation, and where you can read all the details and use this um, to design your own migration essay. Um, the entire essay starts, of course, with the pre-cultivation of cells. You need to starve your cells from serum for some time. We suggest to do this overnight. And this uh, starving procedure is important as serum by itself is a chemoattractant. If you know would work in the environment which already contains serum, um, cells would only show a very weak response to any chemoattractant or maybe serum as a chemoattractant. We would starve cells overnight and then set up the migration chamber. Do not forget to always set up two different types of migration chambers. One is a control which contains medium up and down, your cells of interest, but no serum or chemoattractant in any of the compartments. On the hand side, you set up your experimental um, yeah, migration chamber. And this is up in exactly the same way, but with the addition of a chemoattractant to the lower compartment. As I said before, very effective and cheap and easily and readily available chemoattractant is serum, so you can add serum to the lower compartment. Then you let your migration chamber go for 6 to 24 hours, and on the next day you want to yeah, quantify your migratory cells. You can do this, as suggested by us, by simply adding a vital dye, a viable stain, which in our suggestion is calcine AM. This substance is by itself not detectable in fluorescence, but it's taken up by viable cells and it's cleaved by esterases. And uh, one of the cleavage products is a fluorescently active molecule. It's seen in green fluorescence. So what you have done with this step, which is easy, just add a bit of calcine AM up here. What you have done with this step is you have labeled all your cells. Now I want to discriminate between migratory and non-migratory cells, and you do this by removing medium, stirring your insert into a fresh plate containing trypsin EDTA, and what happens you can uh, tip the plate once in a while, leave it 10 minutes in the incubator. What happens is that your migratory cells are falling down. You can discard the insert with all the non-migratory cells, and you can now take an aliquot of your cell suspension and read it out in a fluorescence plate reader. And now you have a good measure 
of the amount of migratory cells. And um, in this chart here, or in this experiment here, we have um, um, set up this migration chamber with varying concentrations of serum. They started from zero as a control over 0.4 to, uh, to 5 and 10 percent FCS in the lower compartment. And what you see is there's a little bit of background migration, which always takes place, but already by adding very little serum, in this case 0.4%, you can dramatically stimulate migration and already um, with 5%, this curve runs into saturation. If now we want to address a different phenomenon, which is a bit more in vivo relevant or in vivo-like, namely invasion, we just have to add a little bit to our migration chamber. But before coming to the actual experiment, I would like to um, yeah, brief explain what's going on vivo. The most striking example for cell invasion is the formation of metastasis um, in cancer. So what the uh, cancer cell needs to do in order to form a daughter tumor is to detach from its neighbors and to degrade um, the extracellular matrix surrounding each organ or tissue. If it succeeds to do these two things, then it can find a blood vessel, can enter the blood stream and can finally find sites all over the organism and the body uh, which are optimum for its growth. Uh, it would for, uh, then settle down in these niches and uh, form a daughter tumor. So what we need to add to our migration chamber in order to model this um, phenomenon is we have to add an ECM, a barrier which the cancer cell needs to penetrate. And we do this simply by pre-coding our insert with a thin layer of extracellular matrix. Um, the layer must be thick enough in order to hold these cells back, but allow cancer cells which have certain proteases to degrade it and to migrate through it. So the porous insert membrane is not the barrier here, but the ECM above. And what happens is that cancer cells can degrade the ECM and migrate downwards. The rest of the assay is absolutely the same as um, what, what I stated before. So um, what you usually do in such an invasion assay is that you um, also, um, again, set up two different experiments. One is a classical migration experiment without any ECM barrier. The other one is an invasion experiment with an ECM barrier. And now you compare the migration, which is in the absence, um, uh, sorry, in the presence of an ECM, to the migration which uh, takes place if there is no ECM. And now you can calculate the invasion index, which is giving you the ratio of cells which can still migrate, although there is an ECM barrier. And you see that for aggressive tumor cells such as HT1080, which are known for their invasive potential, the invasion index is rather high. So these cells don't really care whether there is a protein barrier or not. They migrate. On the other hand side, healthy cells such as this fibroblast um, cell line, NIH 3T3, these cells can not invade, only very few cells make it through the ECM. And then interestingly, there are cancer cells, which you would expect to be invaders, but they are barely invading. And this correlates with uh, findings from the vivo situation, because these uh, cells here, in this case MCF7, is a breast cancer cell line. These cells are known to have a very low invasive potential. This correlates also with a lower tendency uh, of fo forming metastases um, in vivo. So you can now um, use these assays uh, to put on top of them a bit a more complicated approach. And I would like to come up with one example from the literature, which is an siRNA approach. This paper was published in Genes and Development, and the researchers went for a little bit of different strategy to set up their invasion chamber. What they have done is they have seeded cells um, to the lower side of the membrane. I will show you later on how this works. And they have let these cells migrate through the in this case, invisible porous membrane of the inserts into an ECM layer, which contains LPA, which is lysophosphatidic assay, which is a chemoattractant. And you can see that the line here um, used here, MDA, MB435, um, had a strong invasive potential. Many cells made it to invade the ECM containing the chemoattractant.
But if now an SIRNA was added to the experiment against the molecule, in this case DIA1, you see that strongly the invasive potential of this line is abolished, is, is gone away. Only very few cells uh, make it to invade. And of course, the question behind this research was um, to um, yeah, strengthen the hypothesis that DIA1, a cytoskeleton-associated protein, to be involved in salvation. And indeed, by knocking down the protein function of this molecule, um, the invasive potential of this cancer cell line could be strongly minimized. So just one example how the classical invasion chamber can be combined with other approaches like siRNA um, or others. If we now look at epithelia and transport study, we will see that we are using pretty much a similar device, namely an insert. Be aware now the pores are smaller, they are 0.401 micrometer, but we are addressing completely different cellular phenomena. So uh, transport is always to be seen in the context uh, of epithelia. And epithelia develop very specific characteristics characteristics in vivo, and we want them to develop them also in vitro. And here we need a cell culture insert. It has been proven that um, features of epithelia are only developed in cell culture, cell culture inserts, but never if you cultivate your epithelial cells in a Petri dish or in a well plate. And I will tell you in a minute why this is believed and this is the case. Um, and epithelium usually develops something that we call polarization. So if we look at this zoom in, uh, we see that there is a cell membrane surrounding each cell. There's a nucleus and there's plasma. And the cell membrane um, is divided into two compartments. One we call the apicone and the other one the basolateral one. And now certain proteins are sorted out by the cells and only localized to either of these compartments. And to ensure that they are not mixing anymore, there's something in between. We call this a tight junction, kind of a barrier that makes sure that apical here and basolateral down here are not mixing anymore. Tight junctions also fulfill another uh, function. They make sure that the epithelial cells form a very strong and very tight barrier. Um, down here in gray is the insert membrane, and here a bit enlarged in the cross section is, um, in this cartoon, one of the pores uh, of, of the pores in the membrane. You see that they are going through the membrane, and you see now, um, or you can now assume that if you would add a substance down here, which could diffuse through the pores, the substance has no chance to, to end up here because there are these tight junctions. The substance only has a chance to go through if real transport happens. So I'd like to spend just a minute more on this epithelial um, polarization. Um, the the um, idea of the, um, we, um, or, or the reason what we believe um, is due to the set to polarize on inserts is that they find pretty much the same situation as they find in vivo, namely, a support that is solid, which in this case would be the insert, but nutrients being supplied from both sides, underneath and above. And, and uh, the latter would not be the case if you cultivate them simply in a Petri dish. Here we provide evidence that indeed such a polarization is occurring in inserts. We have cultivated CACO cells on an insert membrane, and we have then stained them for um, DAPI, which stains the nucleus in blue, for ZO1, which is a tight junction protein, which stains tight junctions in green here, secondary antibody walls in green, and we have stained against one um, marker of the basolateral compartment, which in this case is E. cathirin. And what you see is that from down to up, there is a um, um, red down there, part of this is covered by the nucleus, which is a clear indication that the basolateral compartment has formed. Then there's this kind of belt of tight junctions surrounding the cell, uh, which is making sure that this cell is very tightly bound to its neighbors and it's leak-proof, this kind of bridge, this kind of boundary. And the top of the cell was not stained in this case in order to make the nucleus visible, but if you have applied, or if we had applied a marker for the apical compartment, then imagine that now there would be kind of a head of the cell stained in yet another color. And please be aware that back down there, there is no staining. It's, it appears black. And this is good so because this is where the porous membrane is. 
and the porous membrane itself have very low um, autofluorescence, so that this confocal analysis is not hampered due to autofluorescence of this um, porous membrane of the insert. Comes one example from the literature how a very simple transport assay can be established. Um, in this case, it was MDCK2 cells that were cultivated on the porous membrane, which again in this cartoon is down here. This is the cell with its nucleus. And now, two different proteins, which usually are not expressed in these uh, MDCK2 cells, were transfected. These were um, in particular, OATP8, an importer protein, and ABCC2, an exporter cassette protein. And the interesting thing is um, these proteins were tagged to be uh, able to visualize them in confocal microscopy, in fluorescence microscopy. And what indeed happens is the cell uh, expresses these proteins, we usually don't express, and sorts them out to make sure that they are localized to the appropriate uh, membrane compartments. And this is pretty fascinating that the importer is actually really ending up in the basal lateral compartment where it belongs to, and the exporter is exactly at the other side also where it belongs to. This is where also um, epithelial cells would later on form microvilli. And, and now an interesting experiment can be performed, a, in this case radioactively marked um, octapeptide, CCK81, which plays a role in the context of liver cell function, can now um, be studied in terms of its transport in a completely different cell line. MDCK2 is from kidney, but since importers and exporters were, were artificially expressed in the cell line, um, the transport assay can be set up. And um, um, to, to look a little bit into the data, um, here um, this bar is indicating intracellular accumulation of the protein in the case, or the peptide, in the case that only importer was transfected. Um, it's not surprising because if you only transfect these cells with an importer, they take up the substance, but they cannot release it on the other side, so they are accumulating intracellularly. This is just the control experiment. The real transport assay is performed with the double uh, transfection of the importer and exporter. And what you then see is that indeed all the radioactivity, all the substance goes um, to the upper compartment of your cell culture insert because it's taken uh, up from below. Uh, it diffuses through the membrane pores. Um, it's taken up, it's channeled through the cell, it's released, and it's uh, ending up in the upper compartment. Um, many, just a remark, many um, experiments like this, they are performed with inserts which are actually pre-coded with an extracellular matrix protein such as collagen or fibronectin and helps um, facilitate and speed up the polarization of the cells. Um, if you want to set up a transport assay, you want to make sure that your epithelium is really ready, is really forming a barrier so that your what you are uh, observing is really transport, but it's not simple dilution of your molecule of interest. You can do this by applying two different approaches. One of them is shown to the left. This is the so-called transepithelial electric resistance moment, or TEER, or T-E-E-R. Um, so here you simply introduce two electrodes into uh, the lower and upper compartment, and you measure the resistance over um, the uh, two different compartments. So since the sister in this uh, setup is basically your cells, is your epithelium, any increase in electric resistance um, is, is going back or is derived from an increase in your cell density and in the formation of tight junctions as, um, as yeah, big features of a barrier function. We can also do, and this is what we are uh, frequently applying in our laboratory at Kreiner Bio One is that you can also um, yeah, add a substance to the lower compartment which is only um, diffusible. It's a substance that is known to be not transportable. So this substance, it can be silver yellow or mannitol, if this is ending up or is to be found in the upper compartment, um, there must be a hole in your cell layer. It must be not leak proof, it's not barrier yet. You have to leave this um, epithelium grow for some more days or weeks um, before you can use it in your transport assay. Lucifer yellow is um, fluorescently uh, labeled, 
life. So you can simply yeah, withdraw a sample from your upper compartment, measure fluorescence, and you get a very clear and very simple readout. Also, this will um, be um, more detailed from Griner by one in an application note, which we are going to publish this year. Here comes an example for a tier measurement for a electric resistance measurement. You can see that with cultivation time, this tier value is increasing. Everything above 100 or 200 ohm per square centimeter is regarded um, to be a correlate of a, um, yeah, a leak-proof epithelium ready to be used in a transport study. Here comes an example for such a uh, permeability test to the right. And uh, with this chart, I would like to draw your attention a little bit to different membrane materials. We at Griner Bio One are using um, the acetylene terephthalate with our insert product line. Some other um, yeah, suppliers of inserts decided to use either PDFE or cellulose. Um, Ester, what you can see is that in the tear measurement, um, polyethylene terephthalate is superior, also cellulose is as compared to PDFE. But what we found interesting is that uh, in this uh, independent research uh, from uh, Tahir et al. last year, it was found that in the Manitol test, which is um, a very sensitive assay in order to show you whether your epithelium is, is dense and has expressed all its features, to be ready for a transport assay, that here um, PET was absolutely superior to the two other types of membranes. So this thing that you should be careful when using a product and material of um, porous membrane in order to make sure that it's best suited for your type of cell and also for your type of experiment. So I'd like to provide a little bit of um, yeah, basics and protocols and also proof of principle for co-culture experiments. And I would like to start with this little chart here, which is yeah, outlining the different ways of how cultures can be established. Uh, one is to cultivate cells on one side of the membrane and your co-cultivated cell line is um, cultivated on the other side of the membrane. You can also bring your co-cultivated cell um, much more um, to the distance, which is achieved by placing these cells on top of your, uh, uh, of your carrier plate. Um, or you can carry out um, co-cultures by embedding one cell type into a collagen gel or another EZM gel and seeding the different uh, or the second cell population on top of your gel. This, for instance, typically done when a skin model is reconstructed, and we will see examples for this later on. Cultures are very widely applied, and just to give you some ideas where co-cultures could be uh, useful, um, I came up with this slide here. So co-cultures can be used to stimulate and maintain the differentiation of cells. This can be done for for instance, in the context of stem cell um, cultivation, where you want feeder cells to um, yeah, enrich your cell culture medium and continue cell culture medium with um, certain growth factors. You can investigate immune cell interactions by using co-culture models. You can study paracrine mesenchymal epithelial interactions, and you can also restore heterocellular functions in vitro, such as um, the function of a blood-brain barrier. The example I've chosen here um, is an example which comes from the context of mesenchymal um, cancer cell injections. And for um, doing this, we needed to cultivate cells on both sides of the membrane. And here comes the trick how this works. So you would use, for instance, a 24-well insert, and you would um, place the insert with a sterile um, forceps into the well of a 12-well cell culture plate. So remember, 24-well uh, uh, inserts go into a 12-well plate, and they go into the plate upside down with the tweezers. Um, you add a little bit of sterile water to make something, create something like a small uh, um, humid chamber, and they add your um, co-cultivated, to be co-cultivated cell line uh, in a small aliquot of a cell culture medium. In this case, it's 60 microliters. Um, to the lower side of the membrane, which is now facing upwards. So this little droplet is then held by the insert um, by certain surface tension, 
and you can then add the lid of the plate and um, your little droplet containing your cells of interest uh, will now be held by capillary forces between the plate lid and the underneath side of the membrane. You can keep this set up in the incubator overnight and by gravity your cells will move down, they will get adherent to the lower side of your insert um, and stay attached. On the next day, you take your insert out, put it now in the appropriate plate, which is a 24-well plate. Now you put it in the upright position, and you add medium to both compartments. You add your secondary cell population, and you end up finally with two different cell populations on two different uh, sides of the membrane. A membrane is roughly 20 micrometers in thickness, so these cells have a splendid environment where, where they can strongly interact with each other in a power crane manner without touching each other. And this is what we wanted to study in the context of a epithelial mesenchymal um, yeah, culture model. And um, we um, yeah, tried to model a finding that is known from the in vivo situation from the pathology of breast cancer. Here it is the case that these cancer cells are secreting growth factors which stimulate their neighbor cells. And these neighbor cells then secrete hormones such as estradiol, which then um, is taken up, the hormone, by the breast cancer cells and makes them proliferate, stimulates their proliferation. You end up with more cells, uh, cancer cells, which then can and secrete more growth factors, stimulate their neighbors even more strong, and um, the cancer finally um, apply this positive feedback loop to form for themselves a growth niche, which makes them uh, proliferate very strongly and very aggressively. It may be of interest, of course, to interfere with this process in terms of developing a therapy against uh, breast cancer proliferation. And we... Um, process in vivo finding to the stage of an in vitro co-culture model by simply co-cultivating cells on the upper side of the membrane. These always 5,000 MCF7 cells in a 24-well insert with increasing numbers of healthy neighbor cells, mesenchyma cells, um, which were on the lower side of the membrane. And these um, healthy cells were fibroblasts taken from human skin biopsies. And um, remember, there were constant cell numbers always in all these experiments on the upper side, breast cancer cells. There were increasing numbers of cells, healthy cells on the lower side of the membrane. And now you would probably, if, if both would be healthy cells, you would probably expect that these cells up there, they would uh, suffer if there are more cells down there because they would compete for nutrients, vitamins, or whatsoever. But the opposite is happening. The more you provide the cancer cells with an environment, a cellular environment down there, which they can manipulate and make it produce hormones which they need, the more these breast cancer cells can proliferate. We have shown this on, on the levels. First of all, we have performed immunocytochemistry chemistry against proliferation markers such as KI67, um, shown here in green, and we have simply counted the number of proliferating cells, and we have seen the more co-cultivated cells that were, uh, were done there um, on the other side of the membrane, the more of these breast cancer cells were in a proliferative state. Um, so it's no surprise that also the total cell number was increasing, which is shown here, and also the ratio of proliferative versus um, total cell number was significantly increased. So um, by carrying out these experiments, we were able to write together a little application note which can serve um, as a guideline for some very basic experimental decent setup for you. And this brings me to the um, list topic of application, which I would like to address today, which is organotypic culture and tissue reconstruction. Both of these application have, uh, of, uh, applications have in common that uh, always the cells or the tissues are cultivated at the air-liquid interface, so the um, level of medium is exactly reaching um, the membrane, the PET membrane. The uh, difference is um, concerning the origin of your tissue you are going to cultivate. In the case of an organotypic culture, this tissue is a tissue which was taken out from a, a euthanized animal. If you just think of the hippocampus slice, this is a very common organotypic culture model. And then this tissue is taken, uh, is 
is taken uh, alive, is kept alive in the insert um, for um, yeah, several weeks or even months. In uh, tissue reconstruction, the approach is a little different. Here you start with immortalized cell lines or primary cell lines. So you have single cells, but you puzzle them together in order to build up form a, a tissue that is uh, strongly resembling a tissue that you would find in the living organism. Um, one example is tissue models and I will, uh, skin models, and I will show you in a few minutes how this can be done. Um, where is um, in um, uh, a typical application of a, or kind of typical uh, culture model is, for instance, um, electrophysiology on brain slices. A very typical example for a tissue reconstruction is the uh, already mentioned skin model. Um, here are some um, examples uh, from the uh, um, kingdom of tissue reconstruction and organotypic uh, um, applications, just to give you a little bit of an idea of what all is possible here. A shows a brain slice which uh, was used to perform um, electrophysiology ex vivo. This is a brain slice that was used to introduce a transgene into um, the lateral ventricle, and then the two slice. Um, was um, transferred into an electroporation chamber, and by applying short electric in impulse, um, the transgene could actually be electrotransfected into the ventricular zone of this, this brain. And if this brain slice is now kept in organotypic culture on a thin cell cell culture insert, um, the um, development of this brain slice, it was taken from an embryo, is going on. And you can now easily study the effect of this transgene um, in the context of an ongoing and intact um, development of this um, mouse forebrain. Um, there is a smoking robot. These robots were built and designed in order to be able to take up an insert which was pre-cultivated with an airway epithelium and now smoke from a cigarette can be blown over the airway epithelium and it can study um, which side effects or harmful effects this smoke has onto the airway epithelium. And finally, in D, one of the most important applications in the context of tissue reconstruction is shown, namely skin models which were pre-cultivated in thin cell cell culture inserts. And here you see how a scientist, <laughs> invisible here, um, is now with a brush applying a skin cream on top of the skin model. Later on, histology can be performed and it can be assessed in a very non-invasive and um, not involving animal experimentation way, um, namely the question as to whether this skin cream is uh, maybe harmful to the skin or is not. And I would like to uh, address a little bit more in detail um, skin models as one application. And if you want to reconstruct a skin model, you have to first be aware that this consists, I mean um, skin consists of three layers, namely epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Um, the epidermis is the most important of these layers as it is kind of the correlate of the skin's function as a barrier. This, the epidermis has a horn layer and the horn is finally forming the barrier of the skin. And, but also the dermis uh, is regarded as very important. So finally, most full thickness skin models try to mimic these two layers and reconstruct these two layers in vitro. Hypodermis, which is basically consisting of fat tissue, is not seen to be as important as um, to, to uh, yeah, lead to a need of reconstructing this third layer as well um, in vitro. So, um, as I said, basically epidermis and dermis are the two layers which carry function and which need to be reconstructed. And this is, be, um, is, is achieved by first um, reconstructing a dermis equivalent from fibroblasts, which are poured into a um, collagen gel. It's in, uh, in blue here. So this is simply a gel containing fibroblasts. Usually these fibroblasts are obtained from human skin biopsies. Then the entire dermis equivalent is uh, cultivated in submersed culture for several days 
and then it is uh, ready to yeah, obtain the second larry which is on top, namely the epidermis. Um, so keratinocytes are seeded, are cultivated for a short time in submersed culture, but then the medium level is lowered down to the level of the membrane um, because keratinocytes need air um, in a direct um, exposure in order to differentiate. These cells need the air in order to form horn, which then happens over several weeks, up to three or four weeks of cultivation. Then um, these keratinocytes are differentiated and have formed a horn layer. So the skin model at this stage would contain of dermis and epidermis and would be ready to be applied in a subsequent test. So you can easily imagine if you want to lower down the medium level to the level of the insert membrane, um, there's not much space between the insert uh, under the insert um, in the carrier plate anymore to hold cell culture medium. It is shown here, the insert is here and this is the bottom of the well plate, so a very tiny uh, gap is in between. We therefore introduced a carrier plate which is, ex is uh, specially designed for airlift culture um, and this so-called insert plate can um, Drastically reduce the frequency of cell culture medium exchanges which are required. Here you can leave cell culture medium, which in its volume is much, much higher as compared to the conventional plate. You can leave this medium for at least one week. Some scientists say they can le even leave it for two weeks without any change. And you will later on see that this is very good for your skin model to be reconstructed because these cells want to get adopted to their in vitro environment without being disturbed by medium exchanges too often. So here in the next chart or in the next picture, we see how over time, in, in detail these are days 3, 6, 10, and 13 of cell culture, how over time the uh, full thickness skin model is, uh, is getting ready, is getting mature. You see the dermis here and an indication of an epidermis up there. This is an H staining. Um, on stratum corneum would appear in red here. You see after six and uh, three and six days, there's no real indication of horn having formed. But after 10 days, it's starting to form a horn layer. And now after 13 days, this uh, skin is really ready. It's stratified. It has a dermis, epidermis, stratum corneum. is now ready to be applied in a subsequent test. And if we now, which I haven't done here, would put next to this like a um, histology of a real skin taken out of, of a living animal or, or, or even human being, you would see that this skin very strongly resembles a real skin um, as it's be seen um, in vivo. And the interesting thing is um, when you compare the maturation of skin in a conventional plate where you have to change medium almost every day, at least every second day, to the reservoir plate, the deep well plate, the thin cell plate, which has a large volume available for airlift culture, and these cultures can uh, stay undisturbed for longer times, then you see that some markers, which are in this case filagrin, the marker for the onset of horn uh, formation is only set on at day 10 in this culture here, whereas the other culture, which was um, set up at, at exactly the same day and analyzed also at day one, at day 10, but everything was cultivated in the conventional plate with daily uh, changes. In this culture, the early um, marker for um, yeah, uh, formation of a horn layer is not set on yet. Um, and we have uh, seen this in a reproducible manner and we have interpreted this as a as evidence that um, keeping this reconstructed tissue in an undisturbed um, status for longer times because medium changes are reduced in their frequency helps the tissue to get ready and um, mature. Finally, I would like to end up with um, drawing your attention to our American homepage, http slash bioscience slash documents slash downloadable bibliography. Here on this homepage, you can download a PDF file with um, citing all peer reviewed articles which have been published with our product. We are going to um, um, yeah, do a comprehensive literature research before Christmas so that we can even update our bibliography before the end of this year. So you find hundreds of um, citations of our product in this bibliography 
and this, I think, can be a very helpful resource for you to design your own experiments uh, meeting the requirements of your research topic of interest. And and next to these peer-reviewed articles, also Kreiner Bio 1, a published series of application protocols, which are shown here. Also, they can be obtained as reprints from your sales reps or as PDFs from Kreiner Bio 1's homepage. And they are addressing creation, invasion, immunocytochemistry, confocal analysis, reconstruction of epithelia. There's one paper about uh, trans-epithelial electric resistance moments. There's one about co-culture. There's one about um, organotypic culture and skin reconstruction. And we have this kind of review article um, which you can use to get a wider um, and, and not as deep overview on the product. And then once you have identified your, um, your application field, then you can go to the other more specific papers. And as I said, we will add one more. This year it will be placed down here later on. And this one will address the questions of uh, pre-coding uh, pre inserts for epithelia, Lucifer yellow assay, um, formation of barrier function epithelia, and so on. Yeah, and with this, I would like to already thank you for attending this webinar, and I will now hand back to Maxi, and we all together will be glad to um, receive your questions now and to answer them. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, before we end this session and answer questions, I would like to thank you also for attending our webinar series today and thank Dr. Mulfriedel for such a wonderful presentation. We would like to remind everyone that our webinar series will continue in 2012. Please look for our email blasts and on our website for registration opportunities. Recordings of this and all webinars will be available to those who would like them on our U.S. website, us.gbo.com backslash bioscience backslash webinar have these up as quickly as possible. Also, if you'd like additional information based on the literature pieces you saw here today or a recording of this webinar, please email us at mckenzie.ferron at gbo.com. I have it up here on the screen and also in the chat box for you to use. I'd also like to invite you to find out more about what's going on at Griner by visiting our Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn sites for information regarding promotions, events, and new products. Uh, we'll also be continuing the 2012 webinar schedule on those sites. So let's jump into the questions. What is the difference between translucent and transparent membranes, and for which applications are they used? The um, difference of these different types of membranes is, first of all, as suggested by the word, an, an, an optical one. one uh, the ones that are called transparent, they are indeed transparent. The other ones, the translucent ones, they kind of let the light shine through, but you could not really look through them. But the real difference behind that is the pore density. Translucent um, membranes have a higher pore density as compared to transparent ones, and you should um, basically choose the the appropriate membrane type based on your experiment. For instance, if you want to study transport, you must have as many pores uh, in there as possible because you want to uh, want molecules to diffuse as quickly as possible. So you have to use trans translucent. If on the other hand side you have a different application where you would like to stain cells and want to see them in phase contrast, you have a better chance to see them if you use transparent inserts. Most of them are applicable for uh, immunocytochemistry. So even if you have to use translucent and cannot really see your cells nicely in a phase contrast, you can always go for um, um, immunofluorescence, and then you can see your stills, uh, cells still uh, pretty good in immunofluorescence with translucent membranes. Okay. And, excuse me. <clears throat> what is the suggested mode for co-cultivation of embryonic stem cells and feeder cells? <clears throat> yeah. Here, um, I suggest to cultivate these cells and in, in one of the co-cultivation modes I have suggested before, namely the one where they are cultivated at the distance. That means one cell population is up uh, above the membrane of the insert and the other one is down on the bottom of your carrier plate. And this has the advantage that you can easily separate um, your ear cells from your feeder cells by simply removing your insert and transferring it into a fresh plate. Okay. Is there anything known about microphages reacting or becoming activated by the plastics used in your inserts? Um, 
Our inserts are tested for endotoxin levels. Um, they are guaranteed to be free of um, um, detectable pyrogens and endotoxins. Uh, from this regard, from this respect, there is nothing known about activation. And also, otherwise, um, we did not uh, obtain any feedback from the market from users that uh, activation occurred. We do have an attendee asking, the application note that you referred to that will be coming available soon, do you have a date or an estimated time when that would be available? Um, we can do the, the following. I mean, our timeline is to have our manuscript ready by the end of the year, but uh, then it needs some time for yeah, layout and um, um, yeah, marketing work uh, to finalize the document. What we have done sometimes in the past when customers were interested in one of our application notes in progress, that we made it available um, in draft version. So if this customer would send to us an email, it would be uh, he would be an email account, and I can simply send later this year a draft of our of our application notes. Real right. documents would probably not be available before the uh, beginning of next, next year. Okay. The attendee who asked that question, my email address, mackenzie.ron.gbo.com, is up on your screen right now. If you wanted to send me an email with your contact information, I can most certainly forward it on to Sven, and we can get you the draft that he's speaking about. Uh, we have another question here. Harrison. Anything known about microphage? Oh, I'm sorry, I already asked that, that one. On to co-culture alveolar epithelial cells with alveolar microphages. Would you rather recommend a 0.4 meter or a 1.0 pore size? I wouldn't really see a difference here. I think both of them would work. You want to make sure that your cells are not migrating, but, but by using 0.4 or 1, you make sure that they are not migrating. And from my, my gut feeling would tell me use 0.4 translucent because this is has always been a good standard for all kinds of experiments where you also want to make sure that your cells are kind of paracrine, uh, snilling, uh, and so on. So I would suggest maybe 0.4 translucent, but one should also work. Okay. And I think a final question, unless someone has another that they'd like to ask. How can immunocytochemistry be performed on cells which were cultivated in thin certs? Um, you can remove your medium from the upper and lower compartment, and then use the insert um, as it would be um, a well of a well plate. It has, for instance, 24 well inserts have the diameter of a 96 well plate, and if you have cells that have been cultivated which you want to stain, um, then um, they are kind of blocking the pores, so you, you have a very low chance that your liquid would drain through. So you would simply remove your medium would uh, fix your cells, then you would go through all the steps necessary, such as permeabilization of your cells, blocking non-specific sites, primary, secondary antibody, and so on. Finally, you cut out the membrane, and we have also in one of our uh, application notes, we have a little um, suggestion how to do this. You cut out the membrane with a scalpel, um, and you then mount it onto a glass slide. You cover it with a with a cover glass, and then you can go for high-resolution fluorescence or whatever microscopy. Great. I believe that that's all the questions that we have from our attendees. We want to thank everyone again for attending today. And then please let me send me an email if you'd like a recording before it's posted on the website. We would be happy to provide that. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Okay. Bye-bye.